journey coming up. This episode is sponsored by Natus, formerly Otometrics, the preferred diagnostic equipment supplier of the Dr. Cliff Show. Since the 1950s, Otometrics has been one of the most innovative manufacturers of hearing aid fitting equipment and diagnostic hearing and balance equipment in the industry. When it comes to testing and treating our patients, we only want to work with the best. This is why we use Natus in our clinic. Welcome back to the Dr. Cliff Show. I'm Dr. Cliff Olson, founder of Applied Hearing Solutions in Phoenix, Arizona, and I am here with my co-host. Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Rachel Cook. I'm also an audiologist at Applied Hearing Solutions. And so we are just moving on through episode three of the six-part series covering the patient journey. And so over the last two episodes, we were really working our way from the outside in. So we started with the outer ear and using the otocam to determine if there's any pathologies or conditions in the outer ear. And then we moved on to discussing the use of the Madsen Zodiac tympanometer in assessing the status of the middle ear. And so if you haven't watched either of those, make sure you go back and watch them first. They're most definitely gonna lay the framework for what we are talking about today. Um, so definitely go back to those. And uh, on today's episode, we are going to be talking about the actual audiologic evaluation side of things. And we're progressing all the way to the inner ear here today for that. And um, really, we are talking about assessing hearing thresholds and word understanding and all the tests that go along with that using the Astera 2 audiometer and how we can integrate all of this information into one place through the use of OtoSuite. So uh, make sure to like and subscribe if you haven't already so that you don't miss any of the other episodes in this series. Yeah, there's gonna be a lot of great information that we're uncovering during this series and that's why we really wanted to do this particular series. So let's go ahead and take you back as a reference point from a couple of the first episodes that we did and take you through my ear model that I have here right in front of me. So we started out working with the outer ear. So what everyone thinks of as the outer ear itself, this right here is the pinna that funnel sound into the ear canal here all the way down to the eardrum. So that was episode one, talking about the outer ear. Then last week, we actually ended up talking about the middle ear space, which is the middle ear bones, the middle ear cavity, and the eustachian tube that comes down from that here that equalizes the pressure. But today, we're actually going to be talking about the inner ear and the cochlea that you can see right here, that little coil right there with the nerve coming off of the back of it. And we actually have a graphic of this as well that we're gonna put up on the screen here. That's your cochlea right there. It is, uh, you know, the size of a small grape is typically what we think of it as, and it looks a lot like a snail. It does, oh. and if you look over to the left-hand side of that as well, that is actually your balance system. Those are your semicircular canals, your utricle, and your saccule. So your balance system and your inner ear, your cochlea, your hearing organ are actually connected together. What we're gonna be focusing on today is is the cochlea itself, um, but there are technically two components to the inner ear. Absolutely, and if you have balance or dizziness issues, chances are you're gonna go through an audiologic evaluation mm -hmm. because these two organs are very closely linked. In fact, they are directly attached together. So oftentimes when you have an issue with one, you could potentially have an issue with the other. But again, today when we're talking about the hearing loss treatment journey, we're gonna focus on the cochlea specifically and the structures that are inside of the cochlea. And we have a, another graphic that we can put up here that shows the hair cells. So so you actually have inner and outer hair cells inside of that cochlea that we just pointed out. And these are microscopic images of these hair cells because they are very tiny, but these are the absolute powerhouse of the cochlea mm -hmm. and what allow you to not only hear but comprehend what you are hearing as well. So the outer hair cells are considered the natural ear amplifiers and then the sensory uh, portion of this is the inner hair cells that take the vibration of sound and transfer it up to the brain. So when we look at for like what our goal is here today, mm -hmm. we wanna make sure that you guys understand this sensory organ and how it functions and then how it actually translates mechanical energy into electrical signals that travel up the auditory nerve to the brain. Right, right. So um, then, you know, how do we do this, right? How do we determine 
the status of the health or the integrity of someone's cochlea? Well, we do this through a hearing assessment. So uh, in the previous episodes, we talked about how uh, when you go in for a hearing assessment or an audiological evaluation, you're going to be starting with that case history where they get all of your medical history and background, and then they're going to take a look in your ear, which we talked about with the outer ear. They may or may not need to uh, assess the status of your middle ear using the tympanometer and then we get into the hearing test portion and this is really what people think of when they think of a hearing test right so we're talking soundproof booth most normally um, oftentimes we have like the uh, headphones that go over the ear but really the setup that we're talking about is something that you see here you've got an audiologist or a, a provider on the uh, on the one side running the hearing test side of things and the patient in the booth there as well and so in our clinic specifically, we use the Astera 2 audiometer, which is a computer-based audiometer, so that we can run everything through our, what is that even considered, our monitor, our main, yeah, our main computer. And I'm I so think that that's laptop. really, yeah, I know. And I, I think it's really interesting to go back and look at that graphic. You can see all of the integrated equipment inside of the suite that we typically use that were inside of that yeah. graphic. So uh, today we're specifically talking about the Astera 2 to run these audiologic tests that we're going to be talking about. But you can see the Otocam 300 yeah. there. You can see the realer measurement equipment that they have in the background. And then, of course, all of that stuff is tied together with something called called Auto Suite, so all of the results get to go into one single location, which is really beneficial for us as hearing care professionals to be able to educate our patients on what we're actually finding right. in there. And so I think that what we should go into right now is, okay, how do we use the Astera 2 to identify what's going on with someone's hearing. And so the thing that everyone thinks about when they think of a hearing test is either raising their hand or clicking a button when they hear beeps inside of their ears. And we actually have a graphic that we can show you, and I can walk you through what we're looking at here from an audiogram perspective. So the red circles are the right ear, the blue X's are the left ear. The further down on the graph you see these markings go, the worse the ear hearing is, basically meaning the louder we had to play sound before you could actually detect it. And then from left to right, it's like a piano keyboard where you have the lower pitches on the left-hand side and the higher pitches on the right-hand side. And you can literally get any combination of configuration with this here and we're going to be going into several of them here over the course of the episode today but specifically what we're looking at with the x's and the o's is air conduction so when sound has to travel through the outer middle into the inner ear uh, portion of your ear and then those brackets that you can see there, whether they're the square brackets or the angle brackets, that represents bone conduction as well. So everyone's usually familiar with air conduction with the headphones, but they're not usually familiar with bone conduction. And we have an image of that here as well. There is a bone oscillator that will be placed on your mastoid bone that's located right behind your ear. And that actually takes the vibration of sound and sends it directly into your hearing organ. So if we see a discrepancy in the X's and O's, and the brackets, that would tell us that there is some issue with the pathway of sound working through. And again, if you guys want to learn a little bit more about the conductive hearing loss, uh, you can go back to last week's episode, because if we do see that, we would run tympanometry on you with the Madsen Zodiac tympanometer. Yeah, and we're going to see some pretty significant differences between air conduction and bone conduction thresholds once we get into some of our case studies here coming up. Um, but really, the main goal of the audiogram part uh, or the hearing assessment part there with the air conduction and bone conduction is we're getting these data points um, but these are really data points of detection so i kind of refer to this part as more of a yes or no if you hear the beep you press the button and if you don't hear the beep you don't do anything right um, this is really detection part of sound just acknowledging that there is a sound there However, then we get into the aspect of word recognition testing and speech testing as well. And this is really where we get into more of the identification of specific speech sounds and then the comprehension of them as well. So this is definitely kind of higher order processing here. It's a little bit further than just a yes or no, I heard it or I didn't. And so the first way that we assess this is just by presenting some words and having the patients repeat them back. And what we're doing is we are reducing the volume level of those to the point where you can't hear them anymore and we're finding your speech re reception or speech recognition threshold. 
Yeah, and that graphic, we have a graphic for that too, because you might actually identify this on your audiogram if you've had a hearing test done before. So when you see SRTs there, that is the softest level of speech that you can barely understand. So you're not just listening to see if you hear something, you actually have to be able to understand what you're hearing and repeat it back to the individual who is testing you. And in this particular case for the right ear, this individual could hear speech at 30 decibels, and in the left ear, it required to increase that speech by 10 additional decibels mm -hmm. before they could barely understand understand what was being said. And I think that this is a really interesting test. Uh, in most cases, as an audiologist, we're looking to see if that number lines up with the pure tone average of the X's and the O's that we tested you on. Right. But I think it has more utility to show you if you're having difficulty with soft level speech, you need to find out what the SRT score is to see, okay, yeah, you have really elevated SRT scores, which means you need speech to be louder before you can barely understand what's being right. said. But on top of that, we also want to know what we call supra threshold hearing. So we want to make sure that if we're replacing all of those missing speech components that is occurring because of the hearing loss, how well do you actually understand those words? And that's where the WRS scores come into place. So we have a graphic for that for word recognition scores. And in this particular case, when we tested the right ear at 70 decibels, so a much more elevated level, this individual scored 90% of those words correctly, meaning they were able to repeat 90% of those words back to the tester in an accurate fashion. In the left ear, they were only able to repeat back 50% of the words correctly, which means that their ability to comprehend the sound, even though it was loud enough for them to hear, they weren't actually able to repeat it back accurately. And then a lot of times when we do a binaural test, which is presenting words to both ears at the same time, typically the scores will go up higher because you get a lot of binaural summation effects that occur in order to help people understand speech more clearly. And as you can see, this individual is able to compound the benefit of both ears to score 100% here. And I should reiterate, Anytime that we're doing speech testing in the clinic through the Ostera 2 is that we're able to present it in recorded fashion. So if we're gonna be following best practices, the reason I like the Ostera so much is that it allows us to do everything in best practice format, yep. which means we don't have to use live recorded speech because the variance of my voice is completely different from yours. A complete 180, yeah. So if I were even at the same volume level from a frequency standpoint, our voices are going to sound different. So to keep things standardized and to keep the, the playing field level, so to speak, it's really, really important to use that recorded stimuli. Monitored live voice is just gonna be a little bit too variable. You know, anytime that we have someone come into the clinic with an audiogram that they had done somewhere else, uh, it's usually indicated on the audiogram whether it was recorded speech or monitored live voice. And anytime that we see that monitored live voice checkbox marked, I know that I can't trust those scores and I have to do recorded. And this piece of equipment allows me to do recorded very easily. And it's typically even quicker than me having to say the words myself. I think so too. So. Then both of these are done in a quiet setting, right? So we're having the patient repeat back these words and then doing word recognition score testing. And in both of these settings, you're in that quiet soundproof booth, full attention on the task. Not necessarily indicative of more of the real world settings that we experience, much more dynamic, multiple speakers, background noise, things like that. Um, and so one test that is most certainly not run enough, but it most certainly should be ran more often is speech and noise testing. And there's various different speech and noise tests. In our clinic, we use the quick SIN, which stands for the Quick Speech and Noise Test. And, and in this test, there is a woman who is speaking sentences and a certain level of background noise. And that background noise increases and increases and increases. And what we need is the patient to repeat back as many of the words that they hear in that sentence, um, even if they sound strange and even if it's only one or two, because what we're really trying to see is Okay, we have their previous word recognition and understanding scores, but how does that apply to processing in these more dynamic environments? And so this is really valuable for us as clinicians to be able to uh, kind of relay more realistic expectations for patients as well, um, because how you do on this test is really going to give us an indicator of 
how hearing aids would work for you in that type of environment as well. Yeah, and you really want the highest score possible with word recognition scores because that tells us that if we're treating you with hearing aids, which is the treatment option that's most appropriate for the vast majority of hearing losses that are out there, we want to see that you would do good in a quiet situation. So we want really high percentages of accuracy on that. When it comes to a, a signal to noise ratio loss score, which is what we identify through the test that we do, which is the Quixin, and we have an, a graphic overlay for this as well is that we want to see those decibel levels there being very low. So if you were to score a zero, it would mean you have better than normal hearing and background noise when you're being treated properly for your hearing loss. But if you have a score going upwards of 26 decibels there, it means that you are going to have severe difficulties in a background noise yeah. situation. But here's the thing, if we do not test this, we have no clue how well you should expect to hear when you go into a background noise situation. And again, with the Astera 2, this is, they, they literally take about two minutes mm -hmm. to run the test because it's all integrated there. If we are trying to use like a CD player, if you guys even, I mean, a CD player, <laughs> that's what we used to have to use on some of the older equipment that yeah. existed out there. And it made it so you didn't really want to run the test because I don't want to spend an extra 15 minutes trying to get this score when I can spend an extra two minutes to get this score yeah. if it's all integrated into the same system. And so I just think obviously it's best practices to identify what an individual's performance would be in a background noise situation. And it's just helpful to make sure that you actually do it when it's all integrated together. Yeah, and sometimes it will surprise you, right? So very often uh, I will have a patient that comes into the clinic that's reporting these speech and background noise concerns. We do the initial hearing test and you would look and on the outside looking in, maybe like a mild to moderate high frequency loss. Oh shouldn't have too too many problems right then we do speech and noise testing and they get a score that's that shows moderate severity or severe severity level and it's like the X's and the O's that we see on the audiogram are completely independent of your performance on these speech understanding tasks. And that's what drives me crazy when uh, either providers or individuals try to whittle the number down to like, what percentage of hearing loss do I have? And it's like, well, Can't. there are so many variables that go into hearing loss. Like you could hear great in one variable and you have like the worst hearing loss ever in another variable. And it can yeah. range anywhere between, oh, 100% hearing loss to 0% hearing loss, depending on how yeah. you want to look at it, right? Uh, but another thing that we need to identify is the uncomfortable listening levels. So mm -hmm. when you start thinking about treating someone with hearing loss, you're like, oh, we're just going to amplify all sound. And that's ex that's not how it's done, first of all. But second of all, we need to make sure that we do not exceed a comfort level for an individual that we are going to be treating in this entire hearing loss treatment journey. So we have an uncomfortable level graphic here. At the very bottom of the graph, you can see those U's. And that indicates where the uncomfortable level was identified for this particular patient. Now, the gap between the X's and the O's and the U's indicates the dynamic range that we have to work within comfortably for an individual who has hearing loss if we're going to be amplifying sound for them. So if you were to take all of this information that we just got done discussing, that would complete an entire audiogram report. And we have an overlay of that as well. So this is what a comprehensive audiogram would look like at the end of the appointment session that has all of that data that we just indicated right here on the screen. And I think that once you have a good understanding of this as a patient, I think it helps you understand what's really going on with your ears at a deeper level other than just having an understanding of like what percentage of hearing loss I have. Right, right. So what's so nice is that with the Astera audiometer, we can complete all of these testing protocols through the Astera audiometer, and then we can take all of the results that we got from these tests and potentially even go back into an office, right, and pull them all up on the screen through Otosuite. We can go all the way back to the images of the ear canal previously, the status of the middle ear through tympanometry, and all of the hearing test results as well, including the audiogram, word recognition, SRT, all of those. It's all in one spot, which makes it really, really seamless to take all those puzzle pieces that we keep talking about and put them all together in one spot so that we can view them all and, and kind of make our best diagnosis and recommendation for For there. sure. And, and that's exactly what it is. It's puzzle pieces. It's not a uh, A or B, you have hearing loss or don't have hearing loss. It's like, 
you have hearing loss in what particular area, what's causing that yep. hearing loss, and we really need to have the full picture, have all of the pieces filled in on the right. puzzle before we can make an accurate diagnosis of what's actually going on here. And that's what makes the Otosuite so integral inside of an advanced clinic, yeah. is that they can pull all of this information together very quickly, give you an accurate diagnosis, and have that there to track over the course of time and make it really easy to understand for the patients that you're working with. Agreed. So uh, what we decided to do was take a couple of patients kind of um, from the very beginning all the way through to where we've talked about today so that we're able to kind of walk you through what a specific patient journey would kind of look like and what their scores would look like for different conditions and such. So um, we're going to talk now about a patient who we are going to call Richard. And uh, Richard, when we started with his case history, he came in and said, you know what, on my left side, things feel a little bit muffled here. And I've actually got some tinnitus as well. Um, when I started doing a little bit more digging on that, found out that there was a Q-tip incident of that course. had happened 10 days prior. Uh, and, and he did report that there was some initial bleeding at first, but that it has subsided and that he has no pain or active drainage at this point today. So we've got a video of what we see when I look into the ear and using that Otocam, we are able to visualize that eardrum. And if you watched episode one and two, which you should have by this point, uh, you will have seen this image a couple of times there. So um, when we see that, uh, alarm bells go off for a few things and at this point I was really trying to determine if there was a perforation in the eardrum um, or if the tissue that was seen there had healed over and it was just very thin and very hypermobile um, and so the way that we determine if there's a perforation or not is through the use of Tympanometry. That's right. So the meds and zodiac that we talked about last week would give us a particular indication of whether or not there was actually a perforation still in there, or if it had healed up. And uh, uh, and and then again, even once you identify that, you have to take them through the next step, which is actually running them through an audiogram. So doing a hearing test on this particular individual. And so um, we, I think we actually do have a tympanometry result with this, though. We Let's do. put that graph up. Okay. And this so, is what's important on this one is that we've got the results for the right ear, but you see that the left ear results are absent. I could not get a seal mm. on this ear. And so that tells me again, very likely that there's a perforation in the eardrum. However, I couldn't necessarily confirm it because I don't have a, an ear canal volume measurement to kind of set that into stone. So that is why the hearing test coming up uh, is going to be really, really important in visualizing is there actually a conductive hearing loss there, which would then confirm that a perforation was So present. it's kind of like you, you think that you found the right piece to stick and complete the puzzle, but it actually was, didn't fit. Yep. And there is no piece. So you yep. have to find where that piece is. Where it and is. that really is, that's where we get the, the audiogram where we're going to identify if this individual, Richard, has a conductive hearing loss or not. And we have an overlay of what that actual hearing loss looked like. And so there you go. You're, you start to identify on the left-hand side of that screen the gap between that blue square bracket at 500 hertz and the blue X, that gap indicates that there is, a, that is the largest gap there, indicates that there could be a conductive component there, which would indicate that there is an issue with the sound being transferred through the entire system cleanly into the inner ear. Otherwise, all of those blue X's would be much better lined up with those, uh, those uh, squ the square bracket and angle brackets that are up there on the screen. But again, this is only uh, another piece of the puzzle. We have more information that we need to identify uh, with this gentleman, Richard, and that's when we get into the conductive uh, speech reception thresholds and word recognition scores here. So when we look at the speech reception thresholds, this individual is actually able to understand soft level speech down to a very soft level of 10 and 20 decibels, which is completely inside the normal range. And then when we presented him with more audible sounds at 50 decibels, he was able to score 100% speech understanding or 100% accuracy with those words in a quiet situation, which is really nice. And as you can see, all of this information is starting to get compiled inside of the same location. Yep. And that's the magic of Otosuite when we're using it with Astera 2 and all of the other equipment that combines into it. Right. So we take all of this information and result from there is going to be that this patient is in need of an ear, nose, and throat physician referral because there is a perforation. Likely that perforation is going to go on to heal probably
probably on its own. And I say that because it just, it doesn't, it didn't look red. There's no blood. There's no drainage, things like that. Uh, it looks like it was near the end stages of the healing process. However, it's probably a good idea just to get it checked out regardless. And, um, if we had sent this patient to, or if the patient had seen an ear, nose, and throat physician initially for this concern, they would have had an audiologist that would have completed that entire test at that appointment anyway. So whether you go see an audiologist to start or an ENT to start, you're going to end up with the test assessment that you need, and then the physician will review that from there. It's kind of funny. I think a lot of people just assume, oh, I need to go and see my physician when I'm having an ear-related issue, not realizing that the physician is going to be like, hey, it's great to see you, but can you go see an audiologist first, first so I actually yeah. have a clue of what I'm looking at here right. and what I'm dealing with here? So that's why you, know, you find a lot of uh, audiologists working at ENT clinics and otology clinics because they know that the first step in that journey for them is like, you got to go see the audiologist so they can take you through this journey yeah. that we've been talking about this entire time. So, you know, if you have an audiologist that you know and trust going to them to get this initial testing done and having all of this data that can be compiled inside of this software sent off as a report to that medical professional is extremely beneficial to them. Absolutely. And, you know, what the hearing loss that we just got done looking at was considered a conductive hearing loss. This mm -hmm. gentleman actually did not have any hearing hearing loss due to his inner ear hearing organ. And so when we start talking about the outer ear and the middle ear along this pathway and this journey we've been discussing, we found that there was a breakdown in one of those. Yep. And so, you know, you don't go and jump in, oh, I need to treat you with hearing aids when that is not the proper treatment option here. No. So it's very important to understand when you have a pure conductive hearing loss that oftentimes the proper treatment is not hearing aids for that. Mm -hmm. It is medical intervention to get that corrected. But we do have additional hearing losses that we're going to show you here that lead more into this treatment journey uh, with, you know, properly fit and programmed hearing aids as well. So who do we got next coming so into the clinic? Next up, we've got Phil. So initial case history that we started with, he reported a gradual increase in the difficulty of hearing his soft-spoken wife. We hear this in clinic all the time. Uh, also some difficulty while watching television and in restaurant settings with background noise. Now, he did relay that he had some significant loud noise exposure throughout the course of his life both from working in a fabrication factory for 15, over 15 years without hearing protection. And then also on the side, he was just a hobby, um, mo like to ride motorcycles. So the combination of those two things, he ha has a pretty significant noise exposure history. So uh, first thing, we take a look in the outer ears, right? First step always. We've got a graphic for that and boom, normal, healthy, clear, not, I'm not visualizing anything there that throws up any red flags. Yeah, it looks perfectly clear. So when we're using our Natus Otocam 300, we look, we have a nice big picture of the eardrum here, nice pink colored tissue, translucent eardrum that we're looking at. So to us, it's like, okay, everything in the outer ear portion is perfectly fine. We don't have to worry about that. But now we need to take a look a little bit past the eardrum into that middle ear space. And what we would do here is use the Madsen Zodiac tympanometer to identify what the tympanometry results of this individual will be. And again, we have normal results here. We have normal pressure right along the zero line there. We have normal compliance of the eardrum with the peaks, the tips of those peaks being within the normal range, meaning the eardrum has a good amount of movement both in and out. And everything looks absolutely fine. This individual also ended up having normal ear canal volume. So obviously with having pressure peaks here, we wouldn't have any kind of perforation or anything like that. But the ear canal itself looks great here, which would lead us into, okay, well, you know, we're filling in these missing puzzle pieces. Now we know that there's no outer or middle ear issue. So let's find out what's going on with that inner ear, with that cochlea, and what's going on with those hair cells exactly. inside of there. Exactly. So we've got a graphic for their audiogram results. So they go through the hearing test, and this is what we are left with. So we've also got the severity ranges we can throw over the top there. Um, in just a moment, and that will give us the ranges, there we go, of different hearing loss levels. So as you can see for this individual, number one, when we look at where the red circles and the blue X's are in relation to one another, they're pretty evenly matched up with one another. And so that tells us that the hearing loss is pretty symmetrical and pretty even between ears. As we start in those lower pitches, things are in the mild or in the normal range. And as we start moving into the mid pitches, they are starting to slowly fall, but then we see a pretty steep drop down into the moderately severe range. 
and then a quick recovery out at those highest frequencies that we're testing at. And so this is really one of those characteristic noise-induced hearing loss patterns. We can see some very obvious evidence of patterning of that check mark with that recovery there um, but it is symmetrical and it's most certainly treatable yeah and you know the ear canal plays a big role in this because ear canal resonance will essentially amplify that loud noise he spent 15 years inside of a factory yeah. uh, with a fabrication factory so constantly being exposed to noise all day every day and if you're not protecting your hearing you can cause a lot of damage right around that 4,000 Hertz range is which is where you saw that little noise notch is what we call it in the profession but we need to take a look and see okay we understand there's a hearing loss here but let's see what this individual's ability to understand or hear and understand speech is so if we go into the speech reception thresholds and word recognition thresholds this tells us a story so we can see that at 30 decibels there for the SRTs that he does need speech a little bit more elevated volume wise to barely be able to understand soft level speech compared to someone with normal hearing but then as we go down to his word recognition scores we we can see that he's actually starting to suffer from comprehension here a little bit at 84% speech understanding in the right ear when we correct for that hearing mm -hmm. loss and 92% in the left ear when we replace those missing speech components due to the hearing loss that he has. And then he gets a little bit of a binaural benefit when we present sound to both ears at the same time. He gets a 96% speech understanding here. So this is telling us that not only are some of the outer hair cells being damaged due to the noise, but some of the inner hair cells as well that take that vibration of sound and transmit it cleanly up to the brain, even when you get that vibration right he still is not understanding speech at 100% accuracy. Yeah, yeah, and that's going to have a huge impact on word understanding in a quiet setting, but it's going to have even more of an impact on word understanding and processing in a background noise type of a situation. So then this patient, because of their reports of difficulty in a background noise situation, we moved forward to do the speech and noise test on them as well. We've got a graphic for this too. Um, and so this actually shows you kind of what it looks like on our end when we are actually admitting administering the test. And so over on the left hand side, any of the words that are in green are words that were repeated back correctly. Any of the words that are in gray were not repeated back correctly. And again, you said earlier, this is scored on a zero to 26 scale. And it's just like golf, the lower the score, the better here. And you can see all the way over on the far right hand side up at the tippy top, you'll see where it says SNR loss, and they got a score of six, six dB, which means that any speech or any signal of interest rather that they are trying to hear needs to be six decibels above the level of the background noise in order for it to be audible to them. That's right. And a score of six would indicate, you know, a moderate level of difficulty mm -hmm. in a background noise situation when you're having this hearing loss treated, at least in the tests that we did with hearing aids. And so it's very important to understand this score. And if you're going to be following best practices as an audiologist, speech and noise testing is required for that because I cannot make an assumption assumption based off of speech understanding scores and quiet, like we got with word recognition scores, and extrapolate that to background noise mm -hmm. situations. We actually have to have the background noise testing for us to have any clue of how well you would do in a background noise situation. And typically when someone's experienced a lot of noise exposure over the course of their life and they're missing those high frequency speech components that give clarity to speech, those individuals almost always struggle in a background noise situation. Yeah. So it absolutely has to be done. And the thing that I love about it is that it doesn't take very long to do. I've mentioned this mm -hmm. before. When you have the Astera 2, you can run through, knock those tests out really quickly. There is no excuse not to do them because it doesn't take that much time at all. But the information that you get from that is so valuable, not just for us to understand, but for you to understand as an individual with hearing loss who's struggling in noise. Yeah, yeah. I think it just puts everyone on the same page, right? It really it really puts some of these real world, real world difficulties that they have been experiencing in kind of contextualizes it a little bit and kind of just proves like, okay, even in this best case scenario setting where we have controlled for a lot of these dynamics, this is what we're working with and this is what it means for outcomes and, and treatment and things like that. So, and so what is the proper treatment then for this gentleman? The best and the only treatment option for a hearing loss of this type is going to be properly fit hearing aids. Excellent, excellent. So and we'll see him again 
moving forward. That's next right, episodes. because here in the next couple episodes, we're going to be talking about, okay, now that we've identified what type of hearing loss it is, how it's been impacting their lives, we're going to be able to jump into identifying what's the proper technology and then what are the best practices that you have to follow in order to fit this individual to actually have success. Because just slapping on any old pair of hearing aids ain't going to cut it no. with that type of a hearing loss. Definitely not. Definitely not. So then we move into our final case study here. So for our last one, we have got Barbara. So she had a left-sided hearing loss from a cholesteatoma. And we haven't talked about a cholesteatoma yet, but it's, it's really generally a benign growth that forms in the middle ear space in that tym tympanic cavity. Um, and so it just starts to grow, grow, grow. And of course, its growth impacts the movement of the middle ear bones. And sometimes that cholesteatoma can start to push on the eardrum and potentially even rupture through the eardrum depending on how quickly that it's growing. So because of this, Barbara had that cholesteatoma removed. Oftentimes when they remove the cholesteatoma, they also complete an additional surgery called a mastoidectomy where they actually go in and remove a lot of the cells and space around the tympanic cavity because of infection and things that have been spurred from the growth of this cholesteatoma. So um, we have a picture of what her normal right-sided ear canal is gonna look like. Okay, again, beautiful, great. Um, however, on the left-hand side, we're working with a completely different dynamic here. So there's the picture of what it looks like on that left-hand side. So you can visualize in the bottom left-hand corner, there is a very small, what looks to be tympanic membrane uh, eardrum. And then you have just these really large spaces up at the top there, kind of like in the, the attic of, of that tympanic cavity that have been removed surgically as well. So that tells me straight from the jump, we are probably going to see at minimum some conductive hearing loss from this, um, but we may also see some more sensory neural hearing loss from this as well. Absolutely, yeah, because again, anytime that you uh, take away from the natural pathway of sound moving through the outer ear and into the middle ear, you're going to potentially have some hearing loss that's caused by that, even after you've gone through the medical procedure to address the problem, which in this case for her, for Barbara, was the cholesteatoma that had to be removed. Right. But now, again, we, we still don't know, so we have to put the pieces of the puzzle together. And so with the, the Madsen Zodiac, we have to run tympanometry. So let's look and take a look at what the tymps are here. So if you look at the left-hand side of the screen, which ironically has the right tymp, now, this yeah. is how we live our entire lives, yes. where everything that it's is back. on our left-hand side is all backwards. Um, but the right ear, we see a nice pressure peak there, right at zero, normal compliance, so good movement to the eardrum. But when you move over to the right-hand side of the screen, which indicates that left ear that had the surgery for the cholesteatoma, we were getting a really flat response there. So we're not getting a good amount of movement inside of that eardrum that we would need. So there's potentially having some impedance of the flow of sound through there, which could give her a conductive hearing loss. But again, we need more information on this. So what's the next step that we follow? Next step there, we move straight into the hearing test. And while we're, after we administer that, we end up with this graphic here. So these are the blanket results. Uh, and we also have severity levels for these too. And so you can see on that right hand ear, again, everything is nice and normal. Those red circles are matching up nicely with the brackets. Everything's great. If we look over at the left ear, you can see that in the low pitches, we start out at a moderately severe level of hearing loss. And as we move through those mid pitches and into the high pitches, we actually see a little bit of a rising configuration, which is kind of opposite of what we generally see in clinic with more sensory neural losses. But you can see that between the blue brackets and the blue boxes and, and X's, there's a great deal of separation between the two. And that always tells us that there is something going on with the physical anatomy. Again, we know that this is at the eardrum level or in the middle ear space level that's causing this. And that air bone gap just 100% confirms that there is a conductive component to this hearing loss. But there's also another component to this hearing loss. So jump into that. I'll tell you what, though, when I look at this, I'm like, there's a lot of stuff going on a there. Lot. So not only do we have this mixed hearing loss, which is a combination of sensory neural and a conductive hearing loss in one ear at the mm -hmm. same time, but now we also have an a symmetrical hearing loss yep. that we are dealing with on this, where the right ear is obviously substantially better than what the left ear is. And we need to take a look and see, okay, well, 
what are the, the speech scores that this yeah. individual has. So we need to move on to the speech reception threshold. Now this is where you get a very stark contrast between the two. So the right ear is capable of understanding speech at a very soft level at 10 decibels but you can see how much we had to elevate the sound before this individual could just barely understand speech information and that's at 60 decibels now when you start thinking about what decibels are anytime that you increase the volume of something by 10 decibels you are doubling the volume of it yeah so if you're going to compare her right ear performance to her left ear performance you're starting off at 10 when you go up to 20 decibels in volume you're doubling the volume of it when you go from 20 to 30 you're doubling the doubling 30 to 40 you're doubling the doubling of the doubling 40 to 50 you're doubling the doubling of the doubling of the doubling and then you have to go all the way up to 60 i yeah. don't know if i could do that accurately with yeah, you guys but right. it just goes to show how much more sound this individual needs just to barely be able to understand what's being heard and that's due to the asymmetry as well as that conductive component that's in there as well definitely, definitely. and so if we jump into the word recognition scores here um, what i'm hoping to see is that the word recognition scores are still going to be okay in that left ear and it looks like they're at least okay there i would call those fair scores in the in the left ear but let's look at the right ear individual presented at 50 decibels scored a hundred percent of speech information correctly in a quiet situation and then when we switched over to the left ear obviously we had to elevate the level of speech and do what we call masking which is to put static noise into the right ear so the right ear doesn't help out the left ear because we had to play the sound so loud inside of the left ear at 80 decibels and this individual was able to score 72% of that speech information correctly. Now keep in mind, this is when we are correcting for that level of hearing right. loss by increasing the amplitude of sound because no one's speaking to you, even me, and I'm a loud guy. I am not speaking to you at 80 decibels no. of volume. So that score of 72 is only that good because that sound has been amplified for this individual's hearing loss. Right, right. and I don't believe that I have a graphic particularly for the speech and noise scores for this individual. I'm going to presume because of the asymmetry between the ears that there's some of that at play in this as well. Um, it's always difficult to say because again, you can have an extremely low level of hearing loss and have a significant difficulty in background noise or vice versa. Sometimes we see patients who I go, there's no way he's going to score well on this test and they, you know, knock it out of the park. So, um, and then it goes in priorities too though so if we were to identify this it's like okay we you know need to make sure that there's nothing else that can be done from a medical standpoint mm -hmm. for this individual that might completely change the way or that conductive component that still exists inside of that left ear now chances are she's probably a, uh, already completed all of that yeah. but you know in a variety of different cases it's like i'm not sure that you couldn't get more benefit from doing something surgically potentially right. and they can get them referred out get that corrected now we have them back in we rerun some of these tests rerun a speech and noise test to see okay now that we are definitely ready for hearing aid treatment we need to run that particular uh set of evaluations right right and we most definitely would do that and so uh end result for barbara is that that uh, left ear could not be surgically modified any further so she's going to continue to be monitored by her ear nose and throat physician however uh, she's most definitely a hearing aid candidate on that left side and uh, her decision was to proceed with a single unilateral left-sided hearing aid and we're going to talk about probably her case as well in the next episode and about how that impacts what type and and all the different considerations that go into hearing aid selection. So we need all of these pieces to come together and to kind of make sense before we make any next steps on a hearing aid. And I think that sometimes we move or we hear from individuals, what's the best hearing aid for me? What's the best hearing aid for me? If I don't have all of this information, I have zero answer for you because it doesn't matter if it's the top hearing aid on the market, if it's not going to work for you and your hearing loss. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of variables. As you guys can see, going through all of this, it is not a cookie cutter situation. Um, I do chuckle oftentimes because we get a lot of comments on YouTube and, and they're coming from a good place. They want to make sure that they're treating their hearing loss the best way possible with hearing aids. But the only thing that we know to default to typically as an individual is is, well, what's the best product that can solve right. this problem? Well, we have to know a lot more information other than just tell me what's the best because what's best for Barbara is going to be different from what's best for Richard and, you know, for um, uh, Phil in yeah. there as well, right? So, you know, the complexity of this, I think, is the biggest thing. But 
the complexity needs to be broken down in a way that you can actually understand. It can be contextual to you and your hearing loss. And so when you're starting to piece together this entire journey up through the, to this point, we have recorded inside of this Otosuite software all of this information so then when we take and say, okay, we've got all the information now, let's take a look from beginning to end and let me explain everything that we just identified, that, become, that, that turns you into a better educated individual that you can now advocate for yourself and actually have a decent understanding of what's going on with your hearing loss. Mm -hmm. I, I cannot even state how many times that I have sat down with individuals who have worn hearing aids for years, if not decades. And before we do the hearing test, I'll ask questions of, well, what does your hearing loss look like? What type of hearing loss do you have? Or, or what severity level? And they have no idea, none. No one had ever sat down with them and really explained it out in a way. And, and if they had, they didn't do it in a way where it stuck. Um, because I think it's extremely important, like you said, to be your own advocate in these situations to have a good understanding of what your hearing loss is so that as you move forward through treatment and moving forward you are able to to know what you're working with and, and know kind of why we're doing the things that we're doing yeah Just makes a better relationship between patient and provider for sure you know the funny thing is I, I talk about this all the time going through school we had these paper audiograms that we would fill out and you're using like i don't know a red and blue pen yeah. you know that you you go back and forth between uh left and right and sometimes you you make a mistake and you have to scribble it out and rewrite it in a different location and then you're trying to explain it to a patient and you're like circling different things and drawing arrows. Yeah. And by the time you're done, it's, it looks like there was a nuclear bomb dropped on the audiogram and no one has a clue of what they're looking at it anymore. It looks like the, the what are the, like plays for football where they're like, you're gonna run over here and there's X's over here and O's over here with the arrow, it's coming. And by the end of it, everyone who's looking at it is just like, huh? What? Absolutely. So Otosuite is awesome because uh, there's none of that at right. all. I can, I can, put overlays up on the screen of severity and take them right away again. I can shade certain areas. I can I can do anything that I would normally do with the pen on paper, uh, but it's a lot cleaner, it's a lot nicer, and I think it makes a lot more sense. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, okay, what was our goal for today in covering with this third video in this series? Well, really, we were trying to talk about the key points of what to expect in a hearing assessment. So. From the air conduction and bone conduction testing, we're able to determine the type and severity of the hearing loss that you have. We move on to do word recognition and speech recognition testing as well to understand your word understanding ability um, in quiet as well as in the presence of background noise. And then really using Otosuite to take all of these test results from top to bottom and put them all together in one place so that we are able to best explain the results and then use those results to come up with the best treatment recommendations. Absolutely. So now we are doing a full series here. If you didn't catch us saying this a little bit earlier, so we are doing a six part bonus series and all of this stuff ties together. So you need to make sure that you go back and watch some of our earlier episodes with this as well. And let's start looking at what we're gonna be getting into next week. Now we're gonna be talking about hearing aid selection and 3D scans. If you catch any one of these episodes, well, you wanna catch all of them, but this next one I think is gonna be really cool Cool because it's going to help you understand why we're making certain decisions on certain uh, hearing aids, certain hearing aid technology, and the way that we would need to consider setting them up for you. And then on top of that, doing 3D ear scans. I think everyone's more familiar with having like silicone impressions done inside of their ears. So if you want to see some really cool and innovative tech using the OtoScan, you do not want to miss next week's video here. So we really appreciate you guys tuning in with us. If you have not yet hit that like button, go ahead and do that that really helps out the channel. And if you are not subscribed with notifications turned on, do that as well because that ensures that you do not miss one of our newly released videos. And as always, we will see you next week.